fluttered the rat with his mouth full. Thought I should find you here all right, said the otter cheerfully. They were all in a great state of alarm along Riverbank when I arrived this morning. Rat never been home all night, nor mole either. Something dreadful must have happened, they said, and the snow had covered up all your tracks, of course. But I knew that when people were in any fix, they mostly went to Badger, or else Badger got to know of it somehow. So I came straight off here, through the wild wood and the snow. My, it was fine coming through the snow as the red sun was rising and showing against the black tree trunks. As you went along in the stillness, every now and then masses of snow slid off the branches, suddenly with a flop, making you jump and run for cover. Snow castles and snow caverns had sprung up out of nowhere in the night, and snow bridges, terraces, ramparts. I could have stayed and played with them for hours. Here and there, great branches had been torn away by the sheer weight of the snow, and robins perched and hopped on them in their perky, conceited way, just as if they had done it themselves. A ragged string of wild geese passed overhead, high on the grey sky, and a few rooks whirled over the trees, inspected and flapped off homewards with a disgusted expression. But I met no sensible being to ask the news of. About halfway across, I came on a rabbit sitting on a stump, cleaning his silly face with his paws. He was a pretty scared animal when I crept up behind him and placed a heavy forepaw on his shoulder. I had to cuff his head once or twice to get any sense out of it at all. At last, I managed to extract from him that Mole had been seen in the wild wood last night by one of them. It was the talk of the burrows, he said, how Mole, Mr Rat's particular friend, was in a bad fix. How he had lost his way and they were up and out hunting and were chivying him round and round. Then why didn't any of you do something, I asked. You mayn't be blessed with brains, but there are hundreds and hundreds of you big stout fellows, as fat as butter, and your burrows running in all directions, and you could have taken him in and made him safe and comfortable, or tried to at all events. What? Us? he merely said. Do something? Us rabbits? So I cuffed him again and left him. There was nothing else to be done. At any rate, I had I had learnt something, and if I had the luck to meet any of them, I'd have learnt something more, or they would. Weren't you weren't you at all nervous? asked the Mole, some of yesterday's terror coming back to him at the mention of the wild wood. Nervous? The otter showed a gleaming set of strong white teeth as he laughed. I'd give em nerves if any of em tried on on with me. Here, Mole, fry me some slices of ham like the good little chap you are. I'm frightfully hungry and I've got any amount to say to Ratty here. Haven't seen him for an age. So the good-natured Mole, having cut some slices of ham, set the hedgehogs to fry it and returned to his own breakfast, while the otter and the rat, their heads together, eagerly talked river shop which is long shop and talk that is endless, running on like the babbling river itself. A plate of fried ham had just been cleared and sent back for more when the badger entered, yawning and rubbing his eyes, and greeted them all in his quiet, simple way, with kind inquiries for everyone. It must be getting on for luncheon time, he remarked to the otter. Better stop and have it with us. You must be hungry this cold morning. Rather, replied the otter, winking at the mole. The sight of these greedy young hedgehogs stuffing themselves with fried ham makes me feel positively famished. The hedgehogs, who were just beginning to feel hungry again after their porridge and after working so hard at their frying, looked timidly up at Mr Badger, but they were too shy to say anything. Here, you two youngsters be off home to your mother, said the badger kindly. I'll send someone with you to show you the way. You, you won't want any dinner today, I'll be bound. He gave them sixpence apiece and a pat on the head, and they went off with much res respectful swinging of caps and touching of forelocks. Presently, they all sat down to luncheon together. The mole found himself placed next to Mr Badger, and as the other two were still deep in river gossip from which nothing could divert them, 
he took the opportunity to tell Badger how comfortable and homelike it all felt to him. Once well underground, he said, you know exactly where you are. Nothing can happen to you and nothing can get at you. You're entirely your own master and you don't have to consult anybody or mind what they say. Things go on all the same overhead and you let them and don't bother about them. When you want to, up you go and there the things are waiting for you. The badger simply beamed on him. That's exactly what I say, he, he replied. There's no security or peace and tranquillity except underground. And then if your ideas get larger and you want to expand, why, a dig and a scrape and there you are. If you feel your house is a bit too big, you stop up a hole or two and there you are again. No builders, no tradesmen, no remarks passed on you, on you by fellows looking over your wall and above all, no weather. Look at Rat now, a couple of feet of flood water and he's got to move into hired lodgings, uncomfortable, inconveniently situated and horribly expensive. Take Toad. I say nothing against Toad Hall, quite the best house in these parts. As a house. But supposing a fire breaks out, where's Toad? Supposing tiles are blown off or walls sink or crack or windows get broken, where's Toad? Supposing the rooms are draughty, I hate a draught myself, where's Toad? No, up and out of doors is good enough to roam about and get one's living in, but underground to come back to at last, that's my idea of home. The mole assented heartily and the badger, in consequence, got very friendly with him. When lunch is over, he said, I'll take you all round this little place of mine. I can see you'll appreciate it. You understand what domestic architecture ought to be, you do. After luncheon, accordingly, when the other two had settled themselves into the chimney corner and had started a heated argument on the subject of eels, the badger lighted a lantern and bade the mole follow him. Crossing the hall, they passed down one of the principal tunnels and the wavering light of the lantern gave glimpses on either side of rooms both large and small, some mere cupboards, others nearly as broad and imposing as Toad's dining hall. A narrow passage at right angles led them into another corridor and here the same thing was repeated. The mole was staggered at the size, the extent, the ramifications of it all. At the length of the dim passages, the solid vaultings of the crammed, crammed stored chambers, the masonry everywhere, the pillars, the arches, the pavements. How on earth, Badger, he said at last, did you ever find time and strength to do all this? It's astonishing. It would be astonishing indeed, said the Badger simply, if I had done it. But as a matter of fact, I did none of it only cleaned out the passages and chambers as far as I had need of them. There's lots more of it all around about. I see you don't understand and I must explain it to you. Well, very long ago, on the spot where the wild wood waves now, before ever it had planted itself and grown up to what it is now, there was a city. A city of people, you know. Here, where we are standing, they lived and walked and talked and slept and carried, carried on their business. Here they stabled their horses and feasted. From here they rode out to fight or drove out to trade. They were a powerful people and rich and great builders. They built to last for they thought their city would last forever. But what has become of them all? asked the mole. Who can tell, said the badger. People come, they stay for a while, they flourish, they build and they go. It is their way. But we remain. There were badgers here, I've been told, long before that same city ever came to be. And now there are badgers here again. We are an enduring lot and we may move out for a time, but we wait and are patient and back we come. And so it ever will be. Well, and when they went at last, those people, said the mole. When they went, continued the badger, the strong winds and persistent rains took the matter in hand, patiently, ceaselessly, year after year. Perhaps we badgers too, in our small way, helped a little, who knows? 
It was all down, down, down gradually, ruin and levelling and disappearance. Then it was all up, up, up gradually as seeds grew to saplings and saplings to forest trees and bramble and fern came creeping in to help. Leaf mould rose and obliterated streams in their winter freshets, brought sand and soil to clog and to cover and in, in course of time our home was ready for us again and we moved in.